further ado, I'd love to call up Dr. Margaret Turnbull. She, what I'd love to just say about her on a personal note is we've had two interactions and we could have spoken for days. So Margaret, I'm really delighted and so excited to see what you're going to share and invite each of us to consider. Margaret comes with a wealth of knowledge, 47 years in the space of education, both in England and in South Africa. With no further ado, I'd love to hand over to Margaret. Thank you. And so now we live in hope that as I press things, they will move. I did, I'll give you the funniest story. I was, I was doing a delivery uh, and it was to do with behaviour management in Wales. And it was two secondary schools and about seven primary schools. And everybody was there, packed hall. And I said questions at the end, you know, put your hand up if you're desperate. And we got the slides going up, a different system a while ago. And all of a sudden, hands kept going up. And I'm thinking, why are they putting their hands up? It's, it's not really a funny place, and it's not really a place to ask questions. The hands kept going up. And in the end, somebody stood up and said, it's smoking. And I, t I turned around, and there was smoke coming out of the projector. So <laughs> that's what I do to technological equipment. Got it. Look, just very briefly, to put it into context, um, I was in secondary education in the UK for over 40 years. I was a teacher. I was a head of a department. I was a vice principal. I was a principal. It got missed out. How did we miss that one out? It was a principal. And then I became an educational consultant, moving all around uh, England and uh, Wales I mainly worked in. But since 2000, I began, I came over to South Africa, found this wonderful country, and I've been working with schools, both primary and secondary, since then. Largely working in the Valley of a Thousand Hills. So that's kind of where I work. I do, I work in a couple of other secondary schools and so on. So, but because I've been working in South Africa for so long now, 19 years, I'm really aware of the issues that you face. I know about the large classes. I'm visiting some schools and there are 70 in a class in a primary school. 70. Impossible. Uh, certainly, none of the classes I go in are less than about 45, 46, 47. And I know secondary schools have problems too. I'm also aware of the problem of the curriculum. Uh, a content-based curriculum that leaves you feeling you've got to run through every page in the book and tick every section, which means the children who can't quite keep up just get left behind. You don't have to do it like that, actually. But anyway, another problem. And therefore, you have classes where more and more of your learners are actually unable to keep up. They're not even learning to read and write properly. And they're entering secondary school unable to read and write. And then people blame the secondary schools when they don't get the matric results. We all know why not, because it's not happening in the primaries, because you can't teach reading and writing with 60, 70 in a class. So these are the problems I'm well aware of. Plus, when children get left further and further behind, they become naughty. They've got nothing else to do. You know, it, and if you're a boy, You've got this thing called my macho self. You know, I've got street cred here. I'm not going to let anyone see that I don't understand. So before anyone asks me, I'll just be naughty. And then I'll get told off. And that's fine for them. But it isn't. Because they desperately need the education you can provide for them. Behaviour 
seems to be the key issue according to the media. I would disagree. You're seeing poor behaviour largely because of the problems the children are having with coping with learning. That's the root cause of the problem. And in fact, many times in England, I was brought in by the Department of Education or a local authority, like a province, to go to a school because they said, there's a behaviour problem there. We need you to go and investigate. Tell us what's going on. Try and sort it out. You can go in training. I do training in behaviour management too. And I went there and I spent two days and I went in the classes and I sat there and I watched and I listened. And by the end of the second day, I thought, I'd be badly behaved if I sat in those classes too. They were inaccessible for the children. So, yes, there are children with real behaviour issues, no question about it. But if we can improve the quality of our teaching and learning, we will diminish those problems. Because young people want to learn. Like the film you just saw. Those children are born with inquisitive natures. They want to learn, they want to find out, they want to progress. If we can hang on to that, they will move forward. They will do those things. It's when we lose them and leave them behind that there is a problem. So what I'm talking about today is about curriculum issues. It's about differentiation. Well, what is differentiation? Well, very basically, differentiation is providing opportunities for learners of all abilities to participate in the lesson, both orally and in written form. And you want them to be successful. That's it. It's that simple. But it's also obviously that complicated because it means we have to plan how we get those opportunities for those young people, for the very bright ones, for the ones in the middle, for the ones who are struggling. We want every single one of them to still feel that education is something worthwhile for them and something that they can achieve with. It's helping those learners, all learners, to develop their self-confidence. It's about maintaining their desire to learn. It's about maintaining their engagement in learning. And that, as teachers, is what we're about, isn't it? That's why we wanted to be a teacher. And even though we climb the higher levels and become heads of department, vice principals and principals, actually our job is to make sure the school we are working in is a learning environment where everybody learns. Teachers are learning. Students are learning. If we can, parents are learning. Somewhere where we want to go as a community and work together. So, as a good teacher, I have to really think now about what I'm going to uh, ask you to do. Because teachers don't spend an hour talking to a class, do they? The aim is to get people to participate. And in participating, uh, that is what I want you to do. Because in participation, that is what we actually, um, it, that's how we learn. It's that conversation between teacher and child. It's that interaction that aids learning. Um, I was working in a school with some students actually, just uh, a week or so ago, and there were two brilliant lessons that went on. Those children will never forget one was doing kinetic energy. For the scientists, 
they were running up and down. They were outside, they were running, they were checking things, and they were, you know, they knew what kinetic energy and what else was. And for another group, very simple, basic group, they were doing shapes. Shapes outside in groups of four, call out square and they have to form a square. Call out rectangle, they have to form a rectangle. They were actively creating the shapes with their bodies. And then you were able to, sh I mean the, the children doing it were able to shout, shout out the name and these children got into the shape. They knew it, they'd never forget it. So getting young people participating is a real key to learning. And if we think about it, we don't need computers, we don't need masses of equipment. We just need to think, how can we do it? How can we get them up? How can we involve them? So it's your turn to be involved. Um, but basically, one first, the first means of providing differentiation is to actually look at um, questioning. How do we question children? So I basically am going to suggest to you that what you do is you divide children into three groups. You've got, as I said, the most able, the small group, you've got your middle range, which is your biggest group, you have then got your weaker ones, again a small group. Differentiation means then that before a lesson you actually need to plan the questions. You look at your what the lesson requires and you look for the outcome. Now, when I talk about an outcome, I'm talking about what you want the children to have learnt by the time they leave the room. At the end of every lesson, you should know absolutely what you want them to have learnt. It might be new knowledge. It might be reinforcing old knowledge. It might be interpreting knowledge they've used before. But if you don't know what you want them to walk away with, how are you going to deliver it? You work backwards. So you know exactly what you want them to be able to do. And then you plan your questions before the lesson. And for the most able, you want to provide really challenging questions. These are questions showing that not only have those students understood what you've taught, but they can actually start applying it or interpreting it so they can use it in a different way. Challenging open questions for the few. And you, you'll need two or three. You then have your middle, your majority. You're asking questions of them that will show you they know. They have heard what you've said, they've see, read what, and they understand what they've read. They can give you the information back so they understand it. They've got that knowledge there, it's secure. For your, last, for your least able, you've still got to provide questions. Nice, simple questions. Maybe you've used some key words. Maybe you've used some new words. If you give them a definition, can they tell you what the word is? Or if you give them the word, can they explain what the word means? Nice, simple, little bites. But it means that the least able can get involved in the questioning. The teacher has to choose. You know, you select who gets what questions. But the important thing is they all get involved. So for you to do your little task, I've got the slide up. Because your little task is now, and I'm going to give you about five minutes or so, I would like you to turn to people next to you, behind you, in front of you. I'd like you to think of a topic or a subject you're, that you know about. Think of the content of that lesson. And I'd like you to work out one question for the most able that would stretch, 
one question from the middle of the road that would show they've understood and one question that you could ask some least able children so that they could answer that limited question. So if I give you five minutes, get yourselves together in twos or threes and come up with an answer and then we'll see what the answers are. And I haven't got any prizes, I'm afraid, but it's good experience. <laughs> Right, that is technically time. Have we, you won't all have finished, but we'll get some examples. Okay. And that was modelling another technique in teaching that, of course, is very useful. And I'm always surprised how many teachers, uh, when I walk in, don't do this. And I'm talking about the UK as well. Uh, because for my sins in the past, I have been one of those dreaded Ofsted inspectors. Um, and if you say the word Ofsted in England, people go, you know, we're evil, ward us off. Um, but basically, when you give the children a task to do, you give them a time limit. Because if you don't give them a time limit, they'll sit and chat for the first 10 minutes. And give them a short time limit. And then remind them five minutes before it's running out. And if you have to, it's better to extend it by five minutes because you know they've worked hard. So always do that. It's a good ploy. Anyway, who is going to volunteer to... Oh, I've got a hand up immediately. And I've got a, I've got a scribe, which is brilliant. So would you like to introduce yourself and your group? And would you tell us basically the topic and then the questions, please. Oh, my name is Tumsani Msomi, uh, working for Tota Teach Project. Uh, the topic uh, on the subject is, is science, natural science. Uh, the topic is photosynthesis. Uh, for the most able, the question will go like this. Uh, what is photosynthesis? Of which the answer is the process whereby plants make food uh, in the presence of sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. And for the middle majority, it will be like this. For, the, for photosynthesis to take place, least three requirements. So which will be carbon dioxide, sunlight, and water. And the, for the least able, choose the correct answer from those in practice. So now I will say, the process whereby plant manufacture food in the presence of sunlight or carbon dioxide is, and in brackets, there will be respiration, uh, photosynthesis, and that's why. Thank you very much. That's, that's a super example. Will somebody else give us another example from another subject area? Okay. It's grade five mathematics fractions. For my most able, it's a problem-solving lesson. I have 30 sweets. I have eaten one-third of my sweets. How many sweets am I left with? And for my meal, same question. How may, OK, I have 30 sweets. I have eaten one third of my sweets. How many sweets did I eat? For my loving ones, least able, I have eaten, oh sorry, I have 30 sweets. I have eaten one third. What fraction of my sweets am I left with? What fraction of my sweets? <laughs> uh, is it very difficult? Uh, uh, no, I can tell you, I can tell you. It's a long road for, for able ones because they have to calculate what is one third of, twi oh, sorry, of 30 sweets. And then they have to find that, okay, I have 10 sweets. 
But the question doesn't ask them to give how many sweets I ate. It is how many sweets am I left with. So it means from 30 sweets, they have to subtract 10 sweets to get 20. But for the middle, it will be one third of 30, which is very easy, 10 sweets. For my, those, it will be, oh, okay, my mom taught me that one third, to make a whole, if I have one third, it means I'm short of two thirds, because my whole is three thirds. Very simple. And do we have one more? Oh, brilliant, thank you. Hello, um, I'm from Summerfield Primary, and uh, we're doing an English lesson with the grade fives. It's from our blue book, and uh, we actually did it today. It's called uh, The Biography of Nelson Mandela. So for our least able, we could ask, where was Mandela born, or when was Mandela born? For the average, we could ask, as a young boy, what dreams did he have? Like to become a lawyer and to help people or to support people. And for the bright, we could say, do you think Mandela was a good leader? Give reasons. Mm. So that would cover that quite nicely. One more subject. Have I? Yes. You just want to see me running. <laughs> I did run the other day and fell flat on my face, actually. I have the bruise to prove it. Hello, I'm from Siposetu. We took a life skill lesson with the great tools. Topic is transport. For the most able, why do we need transport? For the middle ones, give different kinds of transport. And for the and for those, <laughs> it's just true or false or yes or no. Okay, is anyone else desperate to give their three? If not, I'll hold it there. Okay, right. Well, you can see it's not that hard, and in fact. The more you do this, the easier it gets. That's the reality. And if you are a teacher in a school, and it's a bigger school, and there are more than one of you teaching grade five or four or, or six or seven, then work together and come up with the questions. Because sharing, you know, you'll each have different good ideas, and that sharing is very valuable. And also, yes, it's extra work for the first year, but you keep the questions because the topic isn't going to change as far as we know. And if you bank the questions, you start keeping a bank of questions, uh, and all teachers do that, even if the school holds a bank of questions in a folder centrally in the school, you can have like a box file and you can take the curriculum. So if a teacher changes a year group, they don't have to start again. They can go back and they've got the box file of questions there for you. Sharing material takes, takes less time. It takes time to start with. But all of you hesitated over the least table. You didn't even want to name them, some of them. They're the ones that drive you crazy, yes? And do they sit at the back of the class all the time? Why do you let them sit at the back of the class? Well, actually, if you've got them there, it's not so easy for them to misbehave. If you let them get up at the back, then it's easier for them. So. And, and just remember, these, these young people, I'm going to talk a bit more in a minute, they, they're usually not naughty for the sake of being naughty. There are issues and problems. And this is another difficulty that you face in your schools. You don't have special needs, extra help. And one school I worked in, the, we got the psych, psychological 
psychologist to come in because this child really was kind of crazy, crazy. And the principal got... And they came in and they said, yes, there is this and this problem and this and this, but actually there's nowhere to send the child, so he'll have to stay there. So total acknowledgement, total diagnosis, but no, he's still in the same school. They're managing him. We've worked hard on helping them manage him. But these are the situations. So there's your first lot of work. It's not that hard. If a child suddenly finds he, can, he or she can answer a question and be told they've got it right, they are going to feel so much better. Just put yourself in their place, please. You go to school for seven years, and all the way through your school, you're told, that's not good enough, you've got it wrong, you're not trying hard enough, you're too lazy, you're a waste of space. Could you survive for seven years with those comments? Children are us. Children are us. Okay. So, I obviously now have more work for you. Because I said it's differentiation is not only spoken in questions, it's about the writing work. The most able when you're producing written work for them to do, need open-ended questions. Questions asking them to explain in detail what it is, the work or the topic you've just finished. You'd probably be asking them to write one or two paragraphs come grade seven. You might ask them to write 10 sentences in grade four or five. But you're... You're giving them the topic, you're not going in detail. They have to remember and look at and use their books or whatever to put the detail and say, well, that includes everything. Your middle majority, you would provide them with a list of the information that they need to include. You give them that helping hand. So they've got the topic. They still are going to write something in detail. But maybe you give them four or five bullet points, sentences, you must include. Do not forget, dot, dot, dot. That just helps them be able to achieve it. And again, for your least able, it is something simple. It might be you start, you have a paper prepared with the start of a sentence and they have to finish the sentence off. Four or five words, depending on their ability. It might be that you have a number of explanations of different words and then a list of words and they have to match the correct word with the explanation. It shows they've understood it if they get them right. Um, so it's that kind of thing. It's, it's providing those three different ways of the able soaring, the less able, uh, the less able actually being successful for a change and the middle of the road being in the middle of the road, doing very nicely, thank you. And some of those gradually might move into the other. And now we've talked it through, it's up there. And guess what the next thing is? It's over to you. So I'm going to give you... Oh, we're doing okay. I'm going to give you five minutes starting from now. Try and identify a written task for a subject or a topic. Work with the same people if you like. Use the same lesson or a different lesson. But instead of this being a task that you would talk to them about, this is a task they sit down and write. They have to do it in writing. Okay, so five minutes. Might be nice to choose a different subject, but it's up to you.
Okay, I'm going to call time because I'm mean, nasty and horrible. Well, if I upset you with this world, I'm sorry, but this is apparently what my nephew said about me. I was told the other day, and it did make me laugh, and it was the nep nephew who introduced me to Partners for Progress, and it was basically that she's okay, but she doesn't take any shit. <laughs> That's about it. I always tell children when I'm going into a school to, to do stuff, as a consultant, my job was to work in the worst schools in England, turning them round. So I went into anarchical situations, and, and, and the worst school I was in, four head teachers. There were four of us, and three of us were on duty every day, turning this school around. So fun experiences I've had. Anyway, to start you off, I thought I'd be good and I would work out something. And I even chose a subject that isn't mine. So I chose English and I thought for the most able, I would, I assume they'd been reading a story or a poem, I would ask them to explore the character in the story and identify what might happen next makes them really think. For the middle group, I asked them to describe the character. What does he look like? What did he do? How did he feel? How did he affect others? These are the kind of things you want. It will stretch the middle group, but at the same time you know they've understood what they've read, comprehension. And for the least able, it was producing a, a simple set of questions, um, such as, name the person in the story. What clothes did he wear? What was the colour of his hair? Was he happy or sad? I was picking out questions that might kind of lead to that exploration, and I thought, mm, mm, that would kind of work. So I've given you mine. And it's, it's not even my specialist subject, so who's going to volunteer? Hey, my question for the most able, uh, I mean the topic first will be the school excursion. So for the most able, I'll just uh, ask the grade six to write two paragraphs regarding the uh, school excursion. And then for the middle majority, I'll uh, ask them what is it that they love about the excursion, simple uh, sentences regarding what they loved about the excursion. And then the, for the least able, I would just uh, ask them, list the kind of animals that you saw uh, in the zoo from that uh, excursion. Thank you. So what we would call these in the UK, we call this writing frames. Writing frames. Because the basic... Sorry, can I... So what we, what we would kind of draw up for ourselves is a, a framework. And in here, for the, for the more able, we'd have the simple question, the open-ended question. In a different frame, we would have the question, maybe the same simple question, but then we'd have four or five bullet points so they knew what they had to include. And then the third one, obviously, would be the shorter questions. Now, this does need preparation. You have to prepare the right number of sheets. You know, the teachers know roughly the right children in their class. So if they've got 10 bright ones, they would have 10 like this. Or they would have 10 questions. They, for the middle ones, they would have 20, 30, like this. For the least able, they will have their 10 or 8 or 9, whatever it is. And the teacher gives out the question. So each child gets the question that is appropriate to them. That's the thing. You don't say it out loud. You give them their question. They go on with their question. Preparation, yes. But again, you hold on to what it is that you've done because you will use it again next year. 
And every time you do this, it gets easier. Practice makes perfect. It really does. If you were a learner in a classroom that was using differentiation, would you be more likely to learn? If you were a slow learner, would you be less likely to give up? That's what it's all about. Giving the children the opportunity to learn to the best of their ability. We want the bright ones to soar. We don't want them to be held back, limited by what's in the curriculum. We want them flying away. We want that middle band to really be able to grasp the curriculum that they're covering. But we really, really want the bright ones, the less able ones, to get involved and feel comfortable. And a lot of the ones that are struggling actually have, a le have learning difficulties. And one of the most common learning difficulties that causes problems is dyslexia. Some of you will have heard of it, and some of you won't. I think it's about a year ago that the department actually came, became aware of the word. <laughs> they didn't understand what it meant, but they did become aware of the word. And the schools I've worked in, they suddenly, the principals, see one down here, actually said to me, what's dyslexia? My inspector said dyslexia to me. Oh, okay. It's come to South Africa, has it? <laughs> Basically, 10% of the population has dyslexia. So if you take 10% of your school population, they have dyslexia, approximately. If you have a child who when they try to write, it looks like a spider's got drunk and dips its legs in the ink and writes across the page. You've got some? Yeah? Yeah, we've all seen the, the spider? Almost certainly dyslexic. Real help. You know, they can't write. They really can't. And they can't read. They struggle to read. You ask them to read out and they kind of go, the, uh, how, house. You got some of those? Yeah. Their brain works differently. They can't change. You can never change a dyslexic child. That is for life. You can help them overcome and before, become more successful. Richard Branson is dyslexic. He's done quite well for himself, hasn't he? Tom Cruise is dyslexic. I am too. I'm on the lower level. <laughs> I can't do left and right at all. I'll say go right and point that way. It, there's lots of little foibles and you can learn and you can, over, can overcome it. But these are the children who you'll have in your class who might be at the back of the class being naughty now. But actually you can pull them in because they can answer the the challenging questions. These dyslexic children often have the most amazing, they, they develop the memory. So they'll hear what's said and they can verbalize it and they can answer the most challenging questions. What they can't do is put it on paper. So be aware of them. Give them the challenging questions. Get them engaged, get them involved, and they'll have to have simpler questions to write up. Another way to record them is by tape recording. You ask them a question, you record their answer. You've got a record. It works. But get those youngsters engaged. They're not then the leaders causing the problems in behaviour. So be aware of those. It is complex. It's not a simple thing. Why people are naughty varies. There's a, there's a load of different reasons. <clears throat> and some of them are just, oh, what should I say, maybe they've got a screw loose. You come across, I came across two in 40 years in education. Two. Only two. But there you go. So, Finally, all I really want to say to you is 
Um, principals, vice principals here, heads of departments. Sometimes we do get bogged down in management and paperwork issues. We think it's all about, you know, churning out the bits of paper. We think it's about making sure we're um, getting our school looking good. It's about making sure we've got the buildings secure. And yes, it is to a degree, but the primary task of you and your team at any level is to ensure that learning is taking place. You can have, you can work in a field if all your teachers are focused on learning and you are working with them and they can learn. You can have a brand new spanking school and if the teachers are in conflict and not bothered about really teaching the children and learning, there won't be any learning in that school. It's the people that make the place. Uh, and often what, what I say about teaching is, it's a bit like being a fisherman, is fishing. Sorry, ladies, we're not into fishing. I'm sure some men are. Sardine run time, isn't it? Yeah? So it's a bit like fishing because you're out there hooking them. Once you've hooked a child and you've got it, you've got it for life. Once it's hooked on learning, it won't stop. You've got it. So go out and be fishermen, not of men, but of children. <laughs>